We're going to start off this morning by jumping right into uh, the meat, the heart of the matter. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Jane Carter. She is focused on finding the best ways to deliver care for people with TB and developing programs for prevention and treatment. She works at the Rhode Island TB Clinic, but also spends considerable time in Kenya, working on community-based care programs, the expansion of DOTS, introducing new TB diagnostics for the developing world, coordinated care programs for TB and HIV, which is something we'll talk a lot about. We had uh, expected to hear from her later in the session. Uh, some of these terms and concepts may be new because you haven't had the introductory sessions, but I think given the expertise of this group, you're going to be fine. But as Bob said, it is your responsibility to ask the question. So if you don't get something, um, Dr. Carter is very happy to answer. So come right up. Thank you very, very much. So, so yes, I, actually, I, first I want to welcome you all to the uh, World Conference. Um, I'm the current president of the union, and so it's just my pleasure to welcome all of you here, and I hope you have a, a great uh, week here and actually go back and uh, uh, disseminate the information widely. Um, and I just want to thank uh, everyone for sort of accommodating my schedule. Um, I think it, it was too bad the entire schedule, schedule and agenda was sort of put together so it would really flow well. And on, uh, I think yesterday morning, I, I threw the wrench in saying, oh, my uh, lecture needs to sort of get moved up. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. This is my uh, presentation outline. So I'm going to talk about the unique symbiosis of two epidemics, uh, TB and HIV. I'm going to talk about, to divide this up to diagnosis. Ooh, I'm, I feel like really, I'm really famous. Sorry, yeah, wow. Is this, is this like what happens to like the president of, the, you know, of, a, of sorry, a real country sorry. that yes. when all of these come up? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to divide this up into diagnosis, um, some of the challenges, treatment, and then uh, programmatic support. You heard a little bit about me. Um, but I like people to know who I am. Um, I'm really a clinician first. I'm trained in pulmonary medicine. The last 22 years of my life, I've really spent probably 70% of my time doing TB work. And these are the Winkle Gates at Brown University, which is celebrating its 250th year. It's slightly older than the Union, which will be celebrating its 100th year in 2020. And then in the uh, other uh, slide there is uh, part of my work in uh, uh, Kenya. I've been working in Kenya since 1997 as part of the medical exchange program that my university um, uh, uh, participates in. But also I've been doing uh, most of my, probably most of my TB work there for quite some time. And so as a clinician, I usually start out with the patient's story, and this patient has given me his permission. This story is that his picture is actually from about eight years ago. And um, I was invited to uh, come to a different part of Kenya to help um, a program that was starting up their HIV care program. And I, was, I like to go rounding on the wards, and we came rounding on the wards, and this gentleman was lying in the bed, his face to the wall, told me that he was ready to die. He had been diagnosed with tuberculosis and uh, about four days before. And as part of that tuberculosis um, care, he had actually had HIV testing because the Kenyan government at that time had just recommended that all HIV, TB patients be checked for HIV because of the large amount of intersection by these epidemics. And so he very quietly whispered to me that he was HIV positive and was ready to die because that's what happened when you were diagnosed. He didn't want any of his family to know. He didn't want us to contact anyone. He felt that it would just be better that he disappeared and that no one know. And I like this picture because it has the window there. And so I asked him to sit up for me just a moment. And outside of that window was actually where the week before the HIV clinic had started to dispense antiretroviral therapy. And so I asked him to give us just a couple of days and get him started and that there was care and that he didn't need to say goodbye to his family. So this was really the next day. 
That day he had, had sent one of the nurses get him up into a wheelchair. He'd been wheelchaired over to the ARV clinic and enrolled and taken his first dose of medications and actually sat up this day, asked me to have a picture with him and said, please use my picture to tell the story that hope has arrived, that care has arrived and that my second part of my life has arrived and how much better I feel. Now, in fact, you probably don't feel better with just one day of medication, but you do feel much better knowing that there's hope and that something, something will be there for you. And it's really those types of stories that really inspire me on a daily basis. So why TB? Um, I'm, I, I was trying to look at everyone's names to try to guess where you're from. Um, so I work primarily, you know, half of my time in the United States where I'm told about every day why, you know, why are you, how do you have a career doing tuberculosis work? Tuberculosis is gone. It's not a problem anymore. But in fact, when you look globally, it's still a huge problem. Tuberculosis remains the leading cause of death from a single infectious agent in the world today. It's the leading cause of death in women of childbearing years not because it has anything specific to do with reproductive health, but because in most of the world, this is a disease of young adults. So it actually, in, in causing so much death, it actually causes tremendous social upheaval because it takes away the part of our society that is really most productive and actually has a, a long future of contributing both to society and to their family. It remains the leading cause of death in people living with HIV today, and about 5,000 individuals die every day of tuberculosis, although we have a curative regimen that's been here for 50 years and that cost about 10 US dollars for the entire regimen. I think that that is the statistics that is usually most appalling to me and that one person is infected every second. So if I speak for 60 minutes for this talk, which don't worry, I want, um, about 3,600 people globally will be infected during this one lecture. That just reminds me, um, I'm pretty informal, so please stop me along the way if you have a question, if I'm not clear. I'm used to my uh, brown medical students who are rabble rouse and will hardly let me get through one or two sentences without the hands going up. Um, again, my, uh, my other world is when I'm lecturing in Kenya where, where everyone is, is uh, still respectful to the professor and actually no one asks anything until the very end. But um, I would hope that y'all will ask me if I'm unclear along the way. Tuberculosis is an, in, uh, a disease that is not um, um, universally uh, evenly distributed throughout the United throughout the world. These are the um, one of the maps from WHO from 2011. Uh, don't don't think this is out of date. It's just that actually I went on the web, looked at the most recent map of 2013, and the colors are exactly the same. So I just left my older slide in, and so you can see why. When I'm working in, I'm sorry, I'm using, I'm checking for my technical thing. Ooh, that was not the technical thing I wanted. Um, I'm looking for the uh, uh, laser pointer. Laser pointer is there. Oh, that. And let me too many buttons. It's okay. Give me butt back. There. So you can actually see where I work in the United States, our case rates for active tuberculosis last year were about 2.8 cases per 100,000. So that in my, I live in a, the tiniest state in the United States, it's right up here, it has only about a million people, and we see about 30 cases of tuberculosis a year. This is why most people walk up to me and say, how did you build a career on this, Jane? But, you know, so, but uh, you can sort of see that the other part of my world where um, I spend significant amount of times actually has very high case rates. And I'm actually very pleased that the um, Minister of Health of South Africa is here at the parliamentarian meeting that I just came from and is going to be here at our opening ceremonies because South Africa has the highest rates of tuberculosis anywhere in the world right now with um, about uh, one case per hundred individuals. So the um, 
gradient of tuberculosis is quite different throughout the world. When we think about the different drivers of the tuberculosis epidemic over the last decade, it was really HIV. And so you can actually see how um, the HIV prevalence really overlies the TB prevalence um, globally. This is actually just a picture of the dynamics of the two epidemics and how they occurred in Kenya, which is really emblematic of um, how the two epidemics have tracked each other. Um, what you see is usually that the HIV, that there is in fact in communities a background of TB incidence and prevalence. Okay, so that in sub-Saharan Africa, even if we go back to the pre-HIV epidemic, tuberculosis was still a problem. Okay, now you put on, on a background of that, the HIV epidemic coming along, and in every country where these two things happened, where you had some pre-existing tuberculosis incidence and HIV came into the community, TB incidence continues to go off the scale. Well, we're going to talk about why that is, but I, before we do, I just want to stop, make one stop and give you one basic slide about tuberculosis. And this is my basic slide that goes in every lecture where I am, no matter in the world, whether I'm talking to my Brown medical students or where I, whether I'm talking at the School of Public Health at Brown or if I'm talking at Moy. Because if we don't have the same terminology, then we aren't going to actually uh, understand each other. So TB exposure, TB infection, TB disease, and TB contagion, okay? Everything at the bottom of the list requires that those steps above it have to occur, but each step doesn't have to occur. Before I go through those terminologies, I'm gonna do one other little diversion because you haven't had the basic TB lecture and I think that y'all know this, but again, I just want to say this. Tuberculosis is actually spread through the air by someone who has the lung form of the disease. That person coughs or breathes the germ out, they can leave that area. But the germ stays in the air for about six hours. So anyone walking through that airspace can breathe in the germ. You have to be, you have to cross paths, but you don't have to be there simultaneously. If you breathe in the TB germ at a time that you're healthy, your body can usually wall off the germ. You don't get sick right away, you have no symptoms, so you would never know that you carry the germ until some type of test is done to see if you're a TB carrier or if you have TB infection or until you get sick later in life. That's the paradigm of tuberculosis. The only exceptions to that are individuals who have advanced HIV or small children under the age of two. They don't wall off the germ well, so they go to disease very quickly. So let's go back to exposure, infection, disease, contagion. I like to say, at least when I'm back in my state in Rhode Island, I'm the most exposed person there is in the state of Rhode Island. I spend most of my time in the TB clinic, although you can say, oh, you only have 30 cases there. But then when I'm in Kenya, I actually spend almost all of my time um, in TB clinics or on the wards like I showed you. So I've clearly been TB exposed, okay? I'm also the most tested person in the state of Rhode Island because the United States has all of these guidelines that um, are for healthcare workers to be able to work in their hospitals, to be sure that I'm not the vector of disease to my patients. So I get a test for tuberculosis infection every three months for about the last 20 years, okay? My nurses are rabid about it. They actually follow me around, you know, the hospital or the clinic to be sure I get tested. My TB test is still negative, so I'm not infected at this time. Not every patient who is TB infected or is, is a TB carrier will get sick with TB disease. 
about 10% of people who carry the infection will get sick with TB disease sometime in their life. That's the um, equation where HIV changes that ratio, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And not all of TB disease is contagious. Tuberculosis disease that occurs in the lung is contagious because I can breathe it out and aerosolize the germ again, but tuberculosis disease that occurs in other parts of the body is not contagious. So exposure, infection, disease, contagion. In families, about one-third of, of the family of a contagious TB case will become infected. So not every exposure results in infection. 10% of infections will go on to disease, so not everyone who's infected will get sick. And only pulmonary patients or lung patients are contagious, so not everyone with disease is contagious. The confusing thing, and the reason I want to spell this out for you today, is when people talk about tuberculosis globally, they're primarily talking about tuberculosis disease. In the tuberculosis community now, we're actually trying to begin to talk much more about infection. Okay? For many, many years, the public health response for tuberculosis has to been um, to concentrate on people who are contagious because they're the ones that spread disease. That's only part of those who are sick. And then for a while we were actually only talking about access to care for those who are sick. And we realize now if we want to stop the TB epidemic, we actually need to go back and really talk about TB infection. But I suggest that most of the people who are going to be talking to you this week are really talking about TB disease, and I just wanted to make that clear. In the rest of my talk, when I say TB, I'm going to be talking about TB disease unless I specifically say TB infection. So we've got our messages clear. Okay. Well, what do we know about TB and HIV? Well, there's no clear data available that patients who are HIV infected have an increased chance of infection if they're exposed. Okay? So again, we talked about how people are exposed go to infection. So you have to be in the same room as a person who's contagious or have been in that room to become infected. So we don't have data that shows, we think that HIV positive patients, it makes sense that they, if, ex, if they are exposed to tuberculosis, they're more likely to be infected, but we don't have good data about that. What we do have good data about is this next step, if they are infected, does it change how quickly they get sick? And it does incredibly. Patients with HIV have a higher risk of developing tuberculosis if they're TB infected. Okay. And these are actually two of the older, um, but still a classic, references that talk about that. So the, the overall paradigm is that if I'm HIV negative and I become TB infected, my lifetime risk of developing TB disease is 10%. That totally changes the moment I become HIV infected. If I'm HIV infected and TB infected, I have a 10% chance of developing TB disease per year that I live. So if I live 10 years with my HIV and my TB infection, 100% chance I'm going to get sick with tuberculosis if someone doesn't uh, treat that infection at some point in time. Now. If what happens if I am going from TB infection to TB disease and have HIV? Well, there was actually an, a very elegant study done by Charles Daly in the early epi uh, HIV epidemic in the United States. I have to take you back in to 1992 because at that point in time we didn't have any antiretrovirals. So this actually a paper was actually the description of multiple HIV-infected patients 
who were moving from the hospital into a hospice care or terminal uh, uh, care program um, where they lived. And what had happened is that there, were, there was one patient who actually was diagnosed with tuberculosis in the hospital. He was treated at the hospital but until he became non-contagious, and then he went to the hospice. Over the next three months, there was actually an epidemic of TB cases in that hospice. Okay, And so everybody thought, oh, they had made a mistake when they transferred this patient that they thought were not, was non-contagious into the hospice, because that's what you'd think, right? You know, we'd think, oh, well, it must have been that index case. Well, this was, the other thing that was happening at this time was there was a sudden advance in the ability to do what we call fingerprinting of tuberculosis isolates. Okay. Now, with the TB genome um, project, we actually have the entire DNA sequence of tuberculosis. But in 1992, we didn't have that, and we did what was called small fingerprinting. So um, you know that if I fingerprint you, your fingerprint is going to be unique to you. If I fingerprint you, your fingerprint is going to be unique to you. You know the. Uh, um, uh, police and security forces have used this for years, and I don't know about you, but I had to be fingerprinted, you know, as I came into the European Union with my passport to be, you know, my passport's not unique enough, they fingerprinted me. So we can fingerprint, in 1992, we were able to fingerprint the TB germ. So they took the TB isolate from all of the patients who were getting sick with TB in this um, 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 hospice, and they fingerprinted them. And it was very interesting. The TB for all of the subsequent cases that occurred in the hospice, they were all the same strain, but they were totally different from the one gentleman who had gotten sick in the hospital, they had treated, made him non-contagious, and he came into the hospice center. So he wasn't the source of infection. They were able to track and find who got sick first. And what was amazing and it taught us how dangerous tuberculosis is in HIV is that they were able to show who got sick and became contagious. They were then able to show what subsequent patients, when they became infected, and how rapidly they died. So it was a timeline as short as 12 weeks from the day that these patients inhaled the TB germ till the day they died from overwhelming tuberculosis. That had really never been described except in very, very tiny newborn babies who have, don't have an immune system. So that was the first story, uh, 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 story or uh, uh, description that realized sort of how dangerous tuberculosis was for HIV patients and how quickly it happens and how rapidly we need to be able to make people's diagnosis and get them into care. Now this was 1992. These were patients with advanced HIV. The way we actually mo uh, monitor sort of people's level of immunosuppression in HIV is through their CD4 count. So these patients were patients who had CD4 counts in the range of 5, 10. A normal CD4 count for any of us who are healthy is 600 to 700. So these were very, very advanced patients. So then the question becomes, once highly active antiretroviral therapy came along, does that change this timeline? And does that change an HIV patient's risk? And so it turns out that that does. Actually, antiretroviral therapy for HIV patients actually decreases the chance that if they're infected, they'll on, go on to get TB disease. But it doesn't take it, it never takes it back to as if they had never had HIV infection. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. 
I, I look at everybody's face, so this is just me. I sort of look at the faces and I try to look in people's eyes and sort of figure out, oh, oh, okay. So I think, I think I've got all O's and not the O's, but just let me know if I'm confusing someplace along. And in fact, it's interesting, there's a 25% reduction in the risk of developing TB disease in our HIV patients um, every time you increase their CD4 count by 100. But even if we restore their CD4 count back to, to 600, 700, what we say would look normal, their risk of TB developing TB disease if infected never comes back to the, to the level of an HIV negative patient. It's interesting. This is actually what has led the global recommendations by WHO is that we need bi-directional screening. All TB patients should be screened for HIV because obviously we need to do something not just about their TB, but we should treat their uh, HIV. And all HIV patients need to be screened for TB. So this is easy, right? These are the recommendations. We can all walk away and be happy. Well, it, it's theoretically, it should be easy but it's still not for some reasons. Um, so let's go first to what screening for HIV in TB patients. Theoretically, this should be very easy. HIV tests are very easy to use, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen sort of the HIV tests that are actually in the field now, but in fact, um, I'm not sure if anybody, has anybody actually ever um, had a family member who was a diabetic and you know they are always sort of having a couple times a day to do a little finger stick and check their blood sugar. Well, in fact, the rapid HIV tests are done exactly the same way these days in the field. So we can we can do them in patients' home. We can do them in, in you know in a clinic. We don't have to you know do the blood draw you know in a tube off to the lab, come back. But in fact, in 10 minutes, you can actually know with very good accuracy, that's high sensitivity and high specificity, that someone has HIV or not from just a finger prick, okay? Now, the, there is a window period for false negative tests for HIV. So, so um, this is just the limit of our testings. On the day that you become infected with HIV, there is what is called a small window period of usually a few weeks before there's enough virus in your bloodstream for our test to detect it. But the, the window period is very short, okay? Um, this should be easy because, in fact, if you check some, test someone for HIV, we know H how HIV is spread, spread primarily through um, body fluid exchanges, so it's uh, it's um, uh, your risk of HIV infection is through sexual uh, intercourse or blood or body um, uh, fluid exchanges like through transfusions, things like that, but blood supplies are now screened. So in fact, you should theoretically only have to test someone for HIV once unless they have a new risk factor. Well, just remember, the, what was that risk factor for getting TB? What did you have to go do to catch TB? You got to breathe someplace. You got to breathe someplace in the wrong spot. So at least with HIV, we should be able to talk with the patient and figure out, do we need to retest them again? This is one of our problems with TB, because I can't interview you or interview you and figure out, have you breathed someplace that somebody else walked through? I don't know. That's, mm -hmm. So it's a big challenge. That for HIV um, screening for TB patients, the testing should be done early in care, and the global recommendations are now you test this, you should test a patient with TB for HIV as soon as you make their diagnosis. And in fact, all the current recommendations are any TB patient with HIV should be started on antiretrovirals. So that side of this equation is a little difficult, but not that hard. And the rates of HIV testing in TB patients has actually been 
fairly good. This is actually about a year ago. Um, I like to show this slide because I do work in Kenya, and I think that the Kenyan national government has done a remarkable job in the last uh, 15, uh, last 10 years of making universal HIV testing uh, and the know your status mantra work. Um, HIV testing rates in other countries have, have uh, fallen a bit behind. Why are these reported cases quite so low? Well, um, you can imagine the availability of test kits. This is a, you know, a global epidemic, and so in fact, the production of enough of these rapid test kits are at times difficult. Um, availability of counselors. At least early in the HIV epidemic, it was really felt that this was such a traumatic um, and difficult conversation to have that many places in the world um, required um, uh, anyone who was going to do HIV testing to undergo tremendous, you know, up to three months of counseling and uh, training on how to counsel patients um, about HIV testing. Much of that has gone by the wayside now and that we really know that this can, this is, can be a very easy conversation to uh, initiate. There is still tremendous stigma in many parts of the world about um, HIV, and so people are still quite reticent at times to open that conversation because of stigma. And in fact, I have to tell you that my own personal experience, both in the United States and in Kenya, is that this is really reticence on the part of the healthcare providers, okay? That in fact, many, as when we first started doing um, widespread testing in the United States and widespread testing in Kenya, is always amazing to me that, you know, these are two disparate parts of the world, but the same issues come up. The people who said that this wasn't gonna work were the healthcare workers. You know, my nurses in my TB clinic, when we decided to go to HIV testing for every patient who came in the door, we would offer it. They said, we, we had a, a, you know, big group discussion and it was, oh, patients will be afraid, patients won't understand, patients will run away. Um, I'm not sure I can start this conversation because one, one of, so I, I, try to, I try to lighten this up with some stories, so I hope these will uh, still be funny, but um, one of my nurses was about um, 62, and she had said that the patient who had come in the day before was 90, and she said, oh my God, Jane, you want me to talk to him about his sex life? You know, so it's like, it, it was really about people's, their, our own reticence about talking about HIV and not about the patients. And it really um, uh, was interesting when I, especially I was, uh, when I was working in Kenya in the early, uh, probably 10 years ago when we started um, universal testing, um, I would actually sit with the um, nurses and the healthcare workers who were offering the testing, and at the end of the first day, um, at that spot where I showed you the original patient, the healthcare worker looked to me and said, I'm exhausted. Everybody said yes. I didn't expect that. And then when you actually began to ask the patients, you know, I would usually start out by saying, did you know anyone with HIV? We were talking about working in rural areas of Kenya where uh, uh, the, in, the, in the hospital setting, the HIV uh, co-infection was 80%, and we were seeing half of our patients die every day. They, uh, people knew about this. They just didn't talk about it. So I think that's actually an interesting part of why um, testing rates are often so low. So let's go to the flip side of the corn, coin. Diagnosis of TB and HIV patients. Well, again, this I think is even more difficult than the um, screening of TB patients for HIV. And this is because of a variety of factors. As I explained, was saying that finger stick test for HIV testing is extremely sensitive and extremely specific and extremely easy to do. I think probably if I, I uh, gave, gave uh, you the little lancet, you'd probably be able with maybe a minute and a half of training 
to figure out how to jam this into your finger and squeeze and get a little bit of blood and put it on a tissue. It's not that hard to do. Unfortunately, the state of the art for testing for TB is not anywhere near there. The tests for TB infection are either a tuberculin skin test or a blood test that's called an interferon gamma release assay. So in a tuberculin skin test, you, um, that test actually takes um, 48 hours to incubate in your arm. So in a tuberculin skin test, you actually get tuberculin antigens uh, injected into your arm, and we use the body's reaction to those antigens as a way to measure whether your immune system sees TB germs in your body. But I have to inject this in you, and then you have to go away and incubate your arm, meaning you have to continue to exist for two days. And then you have to come back and show me your arm so that I can measure it. So there's already two visits for somebody to get a tuberculin skin test. So these interferon gamma release assays, I actually expect you're going to hear a lot about them at this meeting. These are tests where you actually take a blood test, a blood uh, sample out of the patient, and you send it off to the lab. And in the lab, they stimulate the white cells that are in that sample and measure this specific chemical called gamma interferon that you will, your white cells will release if they have seen TB before. Okay, it sounds pretty complicated to me, and I spend a lot of my life sort of doing uh, science and complicated things. Well, that's going to be active TB. Okay, so just on my slide, we're going to talk about that next. But the state of the art for TB testing is poor. So latent TB infection is the TB carrier state. Okay, the only way we have to diagnose TB carrier state is through those two tests. You are absolutely right. For active TB disease, we want sputum. And in fact, I think you're, you're saying that you do lots of sputum and it's pretty easy, right, to do? Is it pretty easy? <laughs> it seems pretty easy because we do it a lot, okay? But the, for, the, for the diagnosis of active TB, so TB disease, it's a, a recognition of the organism, that the organism is in, in the body fluids of the patient because we're usually concentrating on lung or pulmonary patients is sputum. So yes, we collect sputum. We have people, it seems pretty easy. You cough in a cup and that goes off to the laboratory. But again, this is not as easy a test, is it, as that finger stick test for HIV that the patient's gonna know when he walks out the door today. So for TB disease, we actually still have to collect sputum or some other body fluid. We have to send it off to the laboratory. For our smear tests, the smear tests are looking under the microscope and seeing if you see the TB germ in the sputum. For the technician to be able to see the TB germ in the sputum, we know there has to be 30,000 organisms in one cc of sputum. So one cc is a very small amount. There has to be 30,000 organisms for him to be able to find one under the microscope. So patients actually have to be fairly advanced in their TB disease for our most common test that we think is easy to be done. And in the laboratory, the um, technician needs to actually look at the slide for, it's called 100 fields. He has to look 100 times at that slide before he could call it negative. So we've, we've actually calculated out that it takes, a, it takes a TB microscopy technician 
about 15 to 20 minutes to look at every slide. So if you're talking globally about large numbers of patients, there's actually another, that's a bottleneck in the system. One technician can really only look effectively at about 30 to 40 slides in a day. Okay. The smear is also insensitive in that it doesn't catch the early parts of TB disease. We'd like to catch people very early on before they get very sick. Culture is the gold standard because if we could culture that sputum, then we could, and even if there's only one TB germ in the sputum, it should grow out and we should be able to make that diagnosis. The problem is that culture to grow the germ out takes anywhere from, if you have a very fancy laboratory that uses some of the more advanced techniques, it takes two weeks. And if you have some of the older um, techniques available, it can take up to three months. So when I first started treating TB patients in Rhode Island as a pulmonary fellow in 1988, when I would take your sputum today, um, I, might, I would have a smear test by tomorrow, but I would have the culture test in January that could confirm early TB. So the limitations of our TB tests are actually still quite problematic. Um, diagnose TB in other parts of the body? We do. Um, the way you diagnose TB in other parts of the body is either to collect uh, fluid or samples of the other part of the body part that you're interested in, and you use the same sort of things. You either use smear, looking under the microscope, or you use culture. The problem is that the other body sites where tuberculosis causes disease, they actually usually cause disease with lower organism burdens. So again, our TB tests become even less sensitive. But you can develop TB in any body part, uh, anywhere from I see TB of the eye, brain, spine, bones, uh, lymph nodes. How effective is uh, to uh, scan these TB infections? as only 10% of these infections develop into disease? Right. The, the, um, so your point is, is that there's a large body of people who are TB infected, and not all of them will get sick. So is screening for TB infection effective? You will be perfect here this week, because actually that also is a tremendous debate. Because what we would really like is a test looking at TB infection that will predict she's infected and not going to get sick. I'm infected and I am going to get sick. That's the test we want. That test doesn't exist in the world. So the state of our care right now is that in countries where it is feasible, anyone who is diagnosed with TB infection is given met medication at that point to kill the germ and wipe out the chance that they'll get sick. But you're right, what it does mean is we're probably giving nine people out of every 10 medication that maybe they didn't really need. So we start treating you know, before uh, getting, getting this disease. I'm sorry? We start treating him before he gets the disease. the disease. What you'd like to be able to do is to treat people in the carrier state for a couple of reasons. One is if you can treat them at that point, they've never gotten sick. You can treat them with less drugs. People that we identify in the state carrier state of TB infection can be cured with one medicine. People with TB disease need a minimum of four medications, so you're exposing them to less medications. And I'm going to go back to my favorite slide. If you treat them at TB infection, they never get sick and they never are contagious. So that is one way that we think we could stop the epidemic, is if you treat somebody before they can become contagious. 
Does the WHO recommend this? Like no, no. WHO, what WHO does recommend is screening for uh, TB infection in HIV patients, and they are now recommending that if you are HIV positive and you can be diagnosed with TB infection, that that person should be treated. The problem is that most of the world doesn't have this set of tests. What about India? What about India? Do you know, I, I've never worked personally in India, okay? Um, I know that some of, I see patients who have come from India with some of these results in the private sector. I don't know that these are available in the public sector at all. But, um, um, for example, in uh, uh, the United States, these are fairly uh, uh, well available, and if we find someone infected, we offer them treatment. In Kenya, our HIV care program at enrollment, if you do not have TB disease, we don't have any of those tests. We don't have skin testing, we don't have a gamma release uh, assay, but the incidence of TB is so high that for our new HIV patients, on day one, you get a rule out for TB disease, and if you don't have TB disease, we give you the medicine for TB infection and for nine months. And by doing that, we've actually been able to show that we reduce TB disease in our HIV patients by 30%. So in high-risk patients, it may be worthwhile. I saw Is it possible that the person, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. That the person who has TB uh, infection Right. Well, that is. Th yep. Yep. You can treat someone who has TB infection, cure the infection, and you don't have to worry about TB disease again. We do know this, and I'll come back to the question that's over here. If I have TB infection once or TB disease, and I take a curative regimen, that if I'm exposed again, my body can actually defend myself from being infected a second time. We know that the treatment um, rates for TB infection are um, 99, 98 to 99 percent effective, so it is effective. The one question we don't know is in areas, say, like, I don't know, is anybody from South Africa? I bring them up a lot. But, for example, South Africa has the highest burden of tuberculosis now. So we don't know if you live in a very high burden country, if we've treated your TB infection once, if that level of community exposure can cause you to be reinfected again. We know that in the low burden TB countries, treat you once, you don't have to worry about it, this is off your list. That's a very, sorry, I'm leaning because that's a very complicated question, so I have to think a moment. You can always tell when I'm sort of squinting. I'm putting, so the preventive therapy, so I'm trying to think of how to put this. If you have, if you were infected with a resistant TB germ, you have to be treated for your TB infection with the medication that that germ is sensitive to. Okay, so you're right. If I get diagnosed with active TB today and say the front row all gets infected by me, then in fact usually what you do is use the, ger the medicines that work on me to work to treat them. Because we don't always have those links, we have population studies. And again, for example, most places you choose the medication that's best tolerable for TB infection, 
that we know treats most TB disease in that region. This is another of one of the challenges we talk about for some place like South Africa, where you have a, a higher burden of drug-resistant tuberculosis. If we do want to try to advance to this type of preventive therapy, what medicine is right to give there? We don't know. Those are some of the things we don't know. We are in the 22 high burden countries for TB and HIV cases is uh, on the rise. We are seeing 16 cases a day. So with these combinations, uh, is there a pattern of uh, what will happen to the Philippines uh, based on your, uh, what you've seen in other countries? Well, you know, um, the Philippines is quite unique. Um, I actually, one of, my, one of my colleagues at Brown is actually from the Philippines and has actually studied the HIV epidemic there for about 15 years. Um, so I, I predict that the HIV TB epidemics of the Philippines are going to more mirror those of, say, the United States where uh, things don't go very much out of control as opposed to what, is hap what happened in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And why is that? That's because I think you have a better health system than sub-Saharan Africa did at the time that all of this was happening. Do you know the most critical issue is do patients have access to care? Can the health systems deliver that care? And I think the Philippines is in a much better, this is my personal opinion, so uh, I think the Philippines is in a much better situation than that generation curve that I showed you from Nairobi in the early 1990s. So given that, do you see the situation to be reversed in the coming decade? I think that uh, if there is political will now, the Philippines can stop this now. Yeah. What is the standard global policy for employment when it comes to PD testing? Because in the Philippines, they require x-rays. So the moment there is no. Passed, well, there is no standard global screening for healthcare workers, um, uh, I would say. So, for example, um, you're right, uh, health, healthcare workers, or at least this would be my interpretation of your question, uh, a global standard for screening for healthcare workers. Uh, most of the world that screens healthcare workers for TB disease with a chest x ray because they're looking for contagious. TB. And that's sort of the recommendation is sort of, and you, the, I'm, I'm having struggle, I'm struggling with your question because there is the question of what do we do for healthcare workers to protect them globally, and what do we do for healthcare workers on the regulation side to protect patients. You don't recommend X-ray as a requirement for TB testing, uh, for employment. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to retreat away from this question, I admit, a little bit. Um, are, you, are you, again, are you asking sort of my personal recommendation, or are you asking, you ask sort of, is there a global the recommendation? Have a stand the union have a stand on this. X-ray against you to employment. I would have to go back through one of the union guides because we, we primarily talk about, the union's approach is primarily talking about protection of health for the individual. And so I think the union guide on healthcare workers is really concerned about being sure that if healthcare workers are exposed to TB that they get appropriate screening and care, so protecting them. Your question is a little bit different because it's the regulatory question of when someone is hired, what has to be done? Do you see what I mean? Or at least that's what I'm understanding. The union actually doesn't comment usually on regulation, regulatory uh, issues such as that. So I'm not sure I helped you with that. So I'll try to help you later. Okay. I'm going to keep going for just a minute. 
Now, um, TV Dyke, so the one thing I'm going to ask you to watch for is, is it Tony Harris that's giving the TB and diabetes lecture? Okay. The last decade and a half has actually um, focused on HIV driving the TB epidemic for the reasons that I've shown you. Okay. But there are other immunosuppressive illnesses that make TB infection move to TB disease much more rapidly. You're going to hear about diabetes. We actually believe that globally, because of the diabetes epidemic that's now occurring, that diabetes will be the major driver for the TB epidemic in the next decade. HIV infection increases the risk of developing TB disease by 10 percent. Diabetes increases the risk of going to TB disease from infection by about, um, it's at 30 percent over a lifetime, so three times greater than someone who's not sick with diabetes. So you're going to actually hear really a very similar story about diabetes and TB that we heard about um, HIV and TB. I'm going to skip this slide. Gene, let me just say we, we actually have I know. a 15 minute window yeah. after, you know, so you, you don't have to be finished in five oh, minutes, exactly. but that's, a, I don't know what your time is. Yeah, no, no, I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking because we've sort of, I, I've sort of meandered a little bit differently than when I, I did this talk last year because I knew it was after one of the others. Okay, well, let's keep going a second. So diagnosis of TB in HIV patients. The issue is that there's a ri wider range of presentations for TB, and we call this the great masquerader. This comes to the question of the young lady from South Africa about the, how do you diagnose TB in other parts of the body. It turns out that in our HIV patients, extra pulmonary tuberculosis is more common in them than our non-HIV patients. Come back to our uh, 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 questions from, was it India? India? Okay. India about smears. It turns out that a smear negative TB disease is much more common in HIV patients. So it just shows you that the, that sputum smear, collecting the sputum, looking at it under the microscope, doesn't work well in these patients. Okay. Turns out we've actually shown that, that you can actually have culture or smear positive tuberculosis with a normal chest radiograph in advanced HIV patients. So that comes to your question from the Philippines. For example, chest x-ray is not a good way to diagnose tuberculosis disease in advanced HIV patients because they can have a normal chest x-ray and still be sick and still be contagious. And we talked a little bit about that window of opportunity to diagnose the patient with tuberculosis can be as short as 12 weeks. So we're talking about tests that don't work very well in a short, very, very rapid period of time. I'm going to not go through a couple of these, uh, those two slides, because they just talked about the um, decreased sensitivity and specificity of testing in HIV patients. So we come back to that WHO recommendation that sounded so easy. It was just two lines on your slide, right? It said, screen HIV patients for TB, screen TB patients for HIV. Not so simple. So on the TB side, all TB patients should be screened for HIV. Theoretically, it shouldn't be difficult, little finger stick test. One time only needs to be done unless you talk to the patient and they have new HIV risk factors. Should be done early in care, and all patients who get diagnosed with HIV should be started on their ART. It's on our HIV patient side, screening them for TB. All HIV patients should be screened for TB. It's just that it's much more difficult. Should we be screening them for TB infection? so that we get them before they're sick and treat them then, but we don't have good tests for that. Should we, in countries that don't have lots of resources, should we just be screening them for TB disease? How should we be doing it? Should it be done under these sputum collections and smears in the lab? Should it be cultures? Should it be 
chest x-rays, how's it going to be done when we don't have great tests for that, and how often are we going to do it, okay? Once I have HIV infection, I have HIV infection for life. How are you going to assess me for TB every time I come to see you? How are you going to figure out, have I been re-exposed? Have I breathed bad air someplace? How often am I going to have to have this test done? So the challenges are quite large on that side. I'm going to talk just quickly about some treatment issues. So early on, too, when, the, when people were talking about tuberculosis and HIV interactions, there was always now this decision, if you have both diseases, I just showed you, we have 12 weeks, we've got to get you started for TB care. Well, let me just talk about how is the care difficult. Let me ask one question. Does anybody take any medications at all in the room? Okay. Have you ever taken a medication for anything? So I've got to get everybody's hand up once, okay? Okay. Now, I'm sure you intended to do it well. And I'm sure you intended to do it right because you wanted to be well. I like to tell the story of I had a tooth abscess about 10 years ago, went to the dentist. He gave me an antibiotic, one pill, four times a day, seven days. Okay? I'm really reliable. Did you see? I showed up 10 minutes early. I wanted to be here. I emailed these folks like 12 million times about I want to talk to these guys. I love talking to these guys. Please let me. You know, I'm very compulsive. At the end of, of my seven days, I can tell you there was a pharmacy error. Because it, at, in my bottle, I had six tablets left. But I know I took those antibiotics four times a day for a week. So it must have been a pharmacy error, don't you think? Because I'm very reliable. I did exactly what they told me to do. Has anybody else ever had this type of experience? No? Everybody else, everybody, everybody else says fine. Well, just to remember, if when we start treatment for active TB, we need four drugs. So just imagine that you've just come in and been diagnosed with TB disease. I need four drugs. In, fixed, in countries where that's fixed dose combinations, where they're all been, being given, you know, in single tablets, for a person my size, that's about six tablets a day. Unfortunately, where I live in, it, where I, part of where I work is in the United States. We don't have fixed dose combinations, so that means 13 tablets a day, right there. Okay? If you've done my finger stick and I've also been diagnosed with HIV, it means I need to be started with three antiretroviral therapies as well. And we've actually found that if you have TB and HIV, you do better if you're given an antibiotic called Septrum or Bactrim because it prevents another set of infections. So I just walked in, and you as a healthcare provider are going to hand me eight different types of medications to start with. I don't know about you, but I didn't do well with one. I'm not sure I would do well with eight, okay? So that there are tremendous challenges now in doing both of this treatment. So early on, we said, well, do we have to treat them at the same time? Do we have to start everything today? And so early on, 10 years ago, we would say, oh, let's start with the TB, and when we finish the TB medicines in six months, we'll do the HIV medications. Well, we actually, there have been many, many studies now that have demonstrated patients who delay their antiretrovirals don't do well. So we can't wait until the TB therapy is done. So the question then becomes, does it need to be started today? Do you need to walk out of here with eight pill, eight medications, it's not eight pills, it's eight medications today? And in fact, the answer is maybe. Okay. It turns out that the sooner that you get your antiretroviral started, the higher uh, survival that you have. And so, in fact, now we actually always try to start the antiretroviral therapy within two weeks of your diagnosis of TB. Okay. 
there's been a clear reduction in death. And here are the survival curves at the bottom. Um, so the need to start when, drug pairing. I'm not even going to talk about that. So there's one other dreaded com com uh, complication. It's called immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Here's, it's this one. So it turns out that when you have advanced HIV, it's like you've just cut off your immune system. Okay, your immune system doesn't work at all. You may get diagnosed with tuberculosis, can start your treatment with tuberculosis, but when we start the antiretrovirals, we've woken up your immune system. And in fact, you can then react to the tuberculosis germ that's still in your body, and, and all of the things that usually happen when you're sick, fevers, um, uh, weight loss, uh, all of the ways that your body usually would tell you there's an infection then occurs. And in fact, what you can do is in the first several weeks of your combined treatment, you can actually get much worse than you were just before you were treated. This is actually a, a picture of a gentleman who, I can't tell, tell what, if you can see it from back there, but he actually had tuberculosis, he came in with tuberculous lymph node disease, and this one spot up on his neck up here was about half that size. Okay, so we stuck a needle in there, diagnosed his TB, did the finger stick, diagnosed his HIV, started him on his TB medicines, Two weeks later, started him on his antiretroviral medicines, and what happened? His immune system went crazy because now it can work. And it recognized that he actually had TB in all of the lymph nodes in the neck. And so, in fact, they all became very enlarged. And so what can happen? Then he walks in and says, you're making me sicker with all of this. Okay, so that in, uh, the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome is something that can happen in about 3 to 5 percent of our HIV patients when we first start them on antiretrovirals. So it's just sort of one more challenge in the combined therapy for both of these epidemics because if this happened to me, would, would I go back to that doctor? No. I'd go, he's crazy. I was, you know, I didn't feel great when I went there and I had a little lump, but now he's given me eight medications and looks what's, what, look, look what has happened. So we actually now have to spend a tremendous amount of time early on in, in counseling of patients. Something happens, please come back. This can happen. This doesn't mean that something is wrong. So. I'm going to go to conclusions so that you can ask questions because I'm a little nervous now because no one has asked many questions much. So it either means that I'm really clear, which is usually not true, or that I'm really unclear and nobody knows what's going on. One question. Could you just go over that linkage between uh, diabetes and tuberculosis disease, that the increasing, if okay. I understand correctly, yep. the increasing uh, prevalence of diabetes uh, will become the largest driver, driver of tuberculosis disease. Yeah. And it is replacing what? Okay. HIV? Yeah. So uh, in the last decade, we had th these type of curves. So that on the background, we had lots of people. So this is Kenya. So we had lots of people who were TB infected. Okay. Nine out of 10 of them were never going to get sick until what happened? The HIV epidemic came in. People began to get infected with HIV here, okay? And so instead of nine out of 10 of them getting sick, all of them were getting sick with TB disease. So HIV became like gasoline thrown on this sort of, uh, 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 the TB embers in the community caused it to flare up, 
And that's actually what drove a lot of the incidence of TB up. We're now aware of the fact that HIV drives the TB epidemic. All of these recommendations have been made that if you have HIV, you get screened with for TB every time you come. If you have TB, you get screened for HIV. And so you can see we're about to publish a paper from East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and um, Uganda that just, just doing ART treatment throughout those three countries is responsible for bringing the incidence of tuberculosis in the countries down. But the next, the next story is going to be diabetes. If I'm, uh, okay, so if I'm TB infected and healthy, meaning no HIV and no diabetes, I have a 1 in 10 chance of getting sick, right? If I'm TB infected and HIV infected, I have a 100% chance of developing TB over 10 years if somebody doesn't do anything about it. If I'm TB infected and I develop diabetes, I have a 30% lifetime risk of developing TB disease, not the 10% risk. Okay? That may not sound like that. That's a little bit, you know, HIV went from 1 to, you know, 10% to 100. Diabetes is only going from 10% to 30% risk. But if you look globally at how much diabetes is occurring, my, there's a obesity and diabetes problem in India. There's an obesity and diabetes problem in China. If you, there's, there's an obesity and diabetes problem in the United States, but we don't have that background of TB infection there. But so if you just look at the numbers of people with those, co, with those comorbidities in those two very large countries, this is what's going to drive the TB epidemic over the next year. And so you're going to see there's a whole symposium at um, the union this year on TB and diabetes, and it's to encourage bi-directional screening, just like we've been doing in HIV now for 10 years. It's going to encourage bi-directional screening for diabetes and hypertension, not, not diabetes, and hyper diabetes and TB. So if you have diabetes in India, you should be screened for TB. If you have TB in China, you should be screened for diabetes. Okay, did, just did that make sense? Yes. Okay. Ooh, if I knew yeah. that. Since we have a separate yeah. speaker on I was gonna say, diabetes, you have a, let's hold that yeah. and ask Tony Harris. Yeah. Hear from ask, I was going to say, ask Tony Harris about that, because I was about to say, if I knew that, then I'd be giving Tony Harris talk. And I think if he knew that, he'd be getting his Nobel Prize in sweets. <laughs> so, but I'd, I'd love to hear Tony say if there's if there's a good. Okay, you have final word or is there one more question? Otherwise, we're gonna let Dr. Carter move on to her next appointment. Go so, on yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, I can only tell you, so I can think the U.S. costs um, the, for the uh, medication for INH costs. U.S. costs are usually the highest, just in case you hadn't noticed. But um, the cost of INH is about $5. The cost of the medicine for nine months is five U.S. dollars. When we buy the same medication for our program in Kenya, we pay about one cent per pill, one U.S. cent per pill. So a hundred, a hundred pills would be one dollar. So a treatment course is about two dollars and seventy cents. Okay, Dr. Carter, thank you. This was terrific, as always. Well. It's always nice, you know, that's the other reason. I'm, I'm glad I came first, because you have nothing to compare me to yet. <laughs>
But you're, you are, you are going to be around. Uh, yeah. They have your email address, so uh, they may email questions. Yes. Or, uh, please do and enjoy it. Please enjoy the union conference. Um, I think it's my favorite time of the year, to tell the truth. Um, and most of, I love the science here, I love the presentations, but I have to tell you that I think the most important thing I found about the union conference is all of the networking. So, in the hall, oh, darn, I went past the last picture again, oh well. But um, in the hall, stop people, talk to people. Um, this is actually where I've made my major collaborators over the last, you know, 20 years of my career. This is where the most fun is. So please, you know, stop people, talk to people, enjoy it, have a good time. And thank you for actually having taken out of your, ta your time to come here to uh, participate in this with us. Thanks. Awesome. And, and thank you.